Well, next we have um, James uh, Verkamen. And James, let's see here. Um, James is, is from the University of British Columbia. He's currently a professor with a joint appointment in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems and the Saunders School of Business. He has served as co-editor of the Canadian Journal of Agricultural Economics from 2001 to 2004. And he is uh, president of the Canadian Agricultural Economic Society from 2010 to 2011. Um, and currently uh, is on is co-editor of the American Journal of Agricultural Economics. So his research interests are broad, and they include commodity pricing, risk insurance, agri and food industrial organization, as well as agri-environmental markets. Without a further ado, I will um, hand the microphone over to Jane. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Karen. I'm delighted to participate today. I'm going to put a plug in for CFAIR, uh, the conference you organized in early May, and uh, today's session extremely well organized, and it's been great for me to get to know uh, your organization and my, some of my American colleagues, and it's been good fun and it's been a real learning exercise for me. I'm going to take a slightly different perspective than Keith. Well, not slightly, quite a different perspective than Keith. Um, I'm going to come at it from a more of a, because I'm currently uh, editor of the AJAE and a former editor of the Canadian Journal of Agricultural Economics, I'm going to talk a bit more about the publishing side of things and where we're heading in that perspective. I'll talk less about policy and, and these sorts of things and data that uh, Keith was emphasizing. Now, I came into, uh, this is my th just about three years as co-editor of the AJAE, and it's been an incredible learning experience for me. I've handled over 450 new submissions to date, so I've been reading broadly and just really getting really excited about economics again. I'm currently serving on a search committee as part of my service function in my faculty here at, at the University of British Columbia, a nutritional science position. And while it's very interesting, they're looking at obesity and uh, health outcomes related to nutrition, I can't help but think that us as economists, we, we really approach our problems with rigor and with creativity and with uh, lots and lots of cool uh, methods. So that really has gotten me excited about being an economist again and, and uh, sort of getting fully re-engaged in research once I finish my final year as editor. Now, I came in being primarily a theory person, so unlike Keith, um, some of you might know my textbook. It's called uh, Agricultural Marketing, uh, Structural Models for Price Analysis. So I tend to look at the world in terms of um, you know, equilibrium and optimization and marginal this and opportunity costs, like most economists do, but I tend to use that as more, more of my framework and somewhat less emphasis on data. So I was a bit, I wouldn't say shocked, but um, the AJE has evolved from when I first started publishing in 25 years ago. It's become very um, data focused, and I had to learn a lot. I spent a lot of long hours learning various econometric uh, techniques. Now, um, I tend to handle papers on commodity prices, uh, productivity measurement, uh, trade, crop insurance, finance and industrial organization. My other, the other three co-editors, they handle the various other topics. So my papers that I handle are mostly empirical and mostly use a very impressive set of econometric methods. Um, these days, panel data is used whenever possible, and it's, now it's increasingly important to have an important identification strategy that's sort of credible and believable and that really gives you, uh, you know, a, a reasonable set of estimates. And then you have to follow up with an extensive set of robustness checks, and these are often published in an online supplement. So we're no longer just a straightforward OLS. In fact, if I just look at some of the recent papers that I've accepted, these are some of the techniques that have been used. Uh, inverse propensity score weighting, confidence intervals for partially identified parameters, the Wu Hausman test for exogeneity, the Gibbs sampler, which is a, for Bayesian estimation for posterior inference, random coefficients logit, simulated method of moments, structural vector autoregression. If you're in the, if you went to grad school in the, you know, 80s and 90s like I did, uh, these were largely unfamiliar uh, topics, so you can imagine the, the, the amount of effort I had to put in to get up to speed on these things. So it's all good. Uh, I think economists are using very impressive methods to try to look at the uh, issues and trying to make sure we're getting unbiased answers and doing our analysis very carefully. It's, it, that's, that's very impressive. But what I can help think is that uh, sometimes now because these econometric methods 
re rely you know on on good data that we're starting to see that the problems that are being investigated and at least published in the American Journal of Agricultural Economics are being determined by data availability. So some of the common data sources that we were seeing being used, which will be familiar to you, we see a lot of emphasis on survey data, especially in development and resource and environmental economics. Increasingly, we're seeing computer labs being set up at various universities and generating large amounts of experimental data sometimes in the format of auctions and sometimes just simply through games that are being played between students and participants. We have a large amount of government data and uh, gov data from NGOs such as the FAO. This is very trade, uh, common in trade and crop insurance and these types of analysis. Of course, we have an abundance of data from futures markets and cash prices and this is being used mostly in time series analysis and agricultural marketing. And now we're seeing more and more scanner data is being used, which is common in, in food marketing. So this is all good. We're seeing, we're, we're seeing some very, very impressive uh, types of analysis. But what I worry about, and I was assigned a topic to talk about agribusiness and food marketing systems, is that many of our interesting and important problems lie within agribusiness and food marketing systems. And uh, not many of you will, of course, agree with me that detailed data is typically not available because of confidentiality restrictions largely, large firms are not, not very eager on sharing their data because it reveals their competitive strategy. And even within government data, they have to block out certain types of data because of worry about confidentiality. So uh, what are we left with? And as markets become increasingly you know, um, vertically coordinated and spot markets sort of are fading away, we're sort of having less and less data available for us to work with. So, of course, we can examine these problems theoretically, but then you sort of have to question the validity of the assumptions, uh, how valid is the theoretical model that you're, you're looking at. And uh, I've had a, actually a, quite a challenge, despite myself being co-editor of the AJAE, I've had challenges in the past of trying to publish my theory-only papers in this journal. Reviewers are typically not keen on theory-only papers. They, they really are happy to see theory combined with data. Or even if you have weak data, I'm seeing increasingly the reviewers I'm using, if uh, the author's data is not particularly strong, for example, if it's only cross-sectional and not panel data, or if it doesn't have a strong identification strategy involved with it, it's often you know, sort of criticized and said maybe it's better for the more applied journal, not, not for the AJAE. So let me tell you about some problems which I think are really fundamental to us understanding in the world we live in and contributing as ag economists that have very little data associated with them. We know that contracts are integral to food marketing supply chains and for the most part we don't have a very good understanding of contracts and how they drive our economic markets. For example, one thing we know very little about is private label contracts between food retailers and food manufacturers. Are these good? Uh, are, is more better? Are they always in the consumer's best interest? So certainly an area that we need to explore, but we don't have good data. Uh, what are the elf welfare implications of a slotting contract? For those of you who don't, who don't know, a slotting fee is something that a food manufacturer will pay to a, a food retailer to get their product placed on the shelf. Is there any evidence of market failure due to holdup? So that's a standard concept of when there is um, um, asymmetric information and uh, sunk costs and uh, the scope for opportunistic behavior. To what extent do we need to worry about this in our agri-food markets? In livestock production, we know there's alternatives. We have production contracts and marketing contracts. How do we know how these compare with regarding risk sharing and incentives? Where's the data to answer uh, these important questions? Uh, increasingly, we know that we're, we're concerned that there's not enough R&D happening in our agri-food systems. You know, public R&D is giving way to more private R&D, and we see uh, more and more this gridlock in commercialization due to the anti-commons problem, like sort of the patent thickets you just can't get through, even if you have a great idea that has some value, and royalty stacking. And then there's the issue about when you do invent something cool and you want to sort of get it to market, how do you get your finance for it? You use a fixed fee or a royalty technology license. What are the determinants of IP protection in agricultural biotechnology? The list of options is growing. Utility patents, plant patents, plant breeders' rights, trade secrets, trademark, tangible biological property. How do you think about this? And once again, where is the data for ag economists to make some sort of contribution and helping policymakers sort this out? We know in genomics can have a very, is having a very profound impact in, uh, on our process and product innovation in the agri-food sector. 
So we ask questions, why has the rate of adoption in marker-assisted selection technologies been relatively slow, despite all the hype about this technology? Where in the supply chain is adoption most likely? How are the benefits distributed? Are there double marginalization issues? These are all important questions that economists should be weighing in on. Uh, are consumers willing to pay the cost of using genomics to facilitate improved traceability and food safety? Increasingly, trying to survey producers and ask them about their, their perspective, say, on genomics is getting very difficult. Producers, like farmers, are just getting survey fatigue, and in fact, they feel they should be compensated for the information that they're providing to the life science companies. Now, another uh, important issue is private standards. We have legally mandated and voluntary private standards. Uh, we have individual comp company standards. The big issue here a few weeks ago in Canada was that our big restaurant chain, Earl's, decided to start buying uh, beef from a U.S. supplier rather than from an Alberta supplier for, because of animal uh, welfare certification seemed to be stronger in the U.S. than in Canada. Well, there's a big uproar, as you can imagine, and it all seems to be sorted out now, but these are the things we're going to see increasingly in the future. How effective are standards in price discrimination? Is that always in the consumer's best interest to have private standards crowd out uh, public standards? And how effective are private standards in solving failure in the markets for credence goods? Again, we teach our students about these things, but we really don't have good analysis other than just sort of teaching them the concepts. Finally, I want to talk about market concentration. Our agri-food markets continue to become monopolized, uh, in, you know, spatial monopolies, for example. We know there continue to be mergers in grocery retailing, uh, but we also know the way groceries are being purchased by consumers is rapidly changing online, through Amazon, and other things. So is it getting better or worse for consumers uh, in terms of, of food prices and availability? Are global food supply chains increasingly preventing local food supply chains from commercializing? Everyone wants local food, but how do we get local food out of the farmers markets and into actual grocery stores? And that seems to be a problem that's getting maybe more difficult rather than less difficult. Is the number of antitrust investigations rising over time? Uh, do we need to put more analysis into antitrust? And which antitrust concerns are the most serious? So with that as a backdrop, I decided to do a bit more reading outside of the AJAE, and I spent some time reading two journals. First of all, I started with agribusiness, and that was a journal I thought would cover off a lot of the topics I was intending to talk about, agribusiness and food marketing, and uh, I guess I was a little disappointed because what I found in agribusiness was not so much the theory of genomics and, and, and food supply chains and the things that are not necessarily data-driven, but I found more articles that are largely data-oriented problems, such as price transmission or results from an experiment. So it seemed to be a bit more of what we do in the AJE, but just a bit more emphasis on, on the business side of things. Then I went to the Journal of Industrial Economics, which is something I don't normally read. And I was actually quite pleasantly surprised, because in, the, in that journal, most uh, papers have a, a short theoretical model that prece precedes and is well linked to the empirical analysis. And the empirical analysis is generally not sophisticated like it is, as sophisticated like it is in the AJE, but it's good solid econometrics and, and the theory and, uh, and the empirical work is always well linked. So my sense is we probably need some more of that sort of journal of industrial economic type research in our journal and try to start to hit some of these other topics that don't have great data but should also need to have to be motivated more by theory. And another issue is the structural econometrics. Uh, I've been really impressed with agricultural economists um, they've been very quick to adopt new techniques in time series analysis, random coefficient estimation, spatial econometrics, and these sorts of things, but they've been much slower to adopt methods of structural econometrics. And for those of you who don't know, that's essentially using the data to identify the parameters of a specific economic model, often like an industrial organization model, trying to recover the parameters and learn more about the theory. So I think learning to do good structural econometrics will enhance one's interest in underlying theory and vice versa. So this sort of brings me to, to my wrap-up comments. First of all, I must say that I, I want to put a plug in for some other journals. I've been reading more and more choices, and I find choices is a great way to learn about the things that I was talking about, genomics and, and uh, these other issues that don't tend to show up in the AJE as much because although they don't have the rigorous analysis, it's a great forum for learning about the issues. So, so I hope Choices is going to continue to be uh, grow and to be widely spread. And the same for journals like Ag Bioform and, the, and these other journals that sort of tackle the issues head on, food policy and places like that. So my, I guess my punchline is I worry that uh, graduate students that we're training today 
are becoming increasing, increasingly preoccupied with the econometrics at the expense of sort of learning basic theory that they need to know how systems link together, uh, industrial organization, information incentives, basic game theory. I'm not saying that they have to become high-level theorists, but I think they do need to have basic theory before they jump onto the, the empirical work uh, so hard. Uh, I see it firsthand for both the contributing uh, AJE authors and the reviewers, I see a definite lack of understanding of the basic theory, the stuff that I've sort of my bread and butter in my graduate school. Either it's not being emphasized in the curriculums or the students are just kind of letting it slip from their, their memory once they get onto their empirical work. And um, so many of the issues being discussed in the preceding slides are not being researched, possibly because they're, they lack data and therefore they don't have, lend themselves to sophisticated econometrics that authors believe are needed to publish in the AJE and other high quality journals, or simply that the students themselves don't really have the training to, to examine issues of food supply chains because they're not really as strong on the theory uh, that they need to be. So let me just uh, wrap up here. Um, what, what role, what can we do about this? I, I think we do need to uh, make changes so that these topics that I talked about are being more addressed. What role do case studies have in serious economic analysis of food supply chains? Well, I think we tend to think of case studies where it's maybe somewhat dismissive because you know they, we don't use our rigorous tools of analysis, but you know when some of these issues they might not be so bad to do either qualitative analysis and focus groups or, or case studies to, to shed light on some of these important questions. I think we should uh, try to bring them up in, in terms of stature and not be opposed to, to uh, publishing these types of papers in journals like the AJE. How do we change the mindset of reviewers and editors who routinely reject papers because they worry about the data? If it's not high quality data, right away you have a strike against you when you're trying now to publish in the, in the AJE and other journals. And I guess maybe this is the most critical comment I have. What is the marginal value of continuing to examine some of these sort of what I would call worn out topics using increasingly sophisticated econometrics? Don't get me wrong, I think agricultural productivity is a really important topic but I've seen so many papers on agricultural productivity over the last two years using l largely USDA data sets and they're simply using increasingly econo sophisticated econometrics and I'm not sure how much more we're going to get out of this topic until we have something, you know, either new data or something, some, some issue, whereas there's so many other things that we should be exploring. And uh, I think many of you know about the controversial AJA invited papers you know, they've, they've, they're no longer, they're now refereed and they haven't had a particularly high publication rate and there's lots of discussion about how we should manage the AJ invited papers. Maybe there's a role for using the invited papers that can steer us down the path of trying to tackle these more complex topics that are not data driven and at the same time, uh, you know, being published in the AJE. So thank you very much and um, I look forward to seeing and meeting many of you at the meetings uh, this summer in Boston and uh, and uh, becoming increasingly engaged in the American the American Association as well as my Canadian society so thank you thank you so much James uh, great presentation especially working in the DC environment the genomics slide uh, really hit home uh, for 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 me and in the communications that I have with folks around here um, we have a couple of questions. Um, some of them kind of reiterate some of the points that you put forward. Um, Emily, Amelia uh, asks, for young ag economists lacking the sophisticated econometric knowledge, what's your advice? Is there a place in the science for them? It's, it's, it's a very good question and it's interesting. I'll, I'll bring it back to the search committee that I'm sitting on to these nutritional scientists and the number of publications, they seem to be all about numbers, like this young postdoc, she's got uh, two years out of a PhD and she's got 30 publications already and that just, like, that just floored me and I don't understand how that works but then you start to read some of the publications and you realize that they're, they're, they're not using the really sophisticated econometrics and so I think there is a role for economists to sort of target a much broader range of journals. It doesn't have to be in sort of the mainstream journals that we always think about. I think we can make a contribution and, and publish in, I don't think we should be aiming to publish five or six a year, but I don't think it has to always be, you know, uh, 
increasingly going for the top journals with the, with the top high level econometrics. I think lower level statistical analysis is just fine if it answers the questions that we're interested in. Great, yeah. And the next one uh, relates really to both presentations. Um, due to the availability and the confidence on data, one stream of research is taking simulation methods. For example, an agent-based model is simulating scenarios under different assumed environments. It starts from strong economic theories, but often suffers from a lack of reality. Um, the question is, do you have an expectation uh, or concern on this method in the standpoint of publication and the implications that it has for policy analysis? So I will, uh, I will unmute uh, Keith as well, um, but James, can we hear from you first? Sure, absolutely, because it's a, it's a very good question, and we're seeing more of this type of analysis, and it sort of relates back to years ago to sort of the, you know, CJE analysis, computer, computerized general equilibrium analysis, where it's a bit of a black box, and you hope the assumptions and, and the functional forms are correct, because otherwise you're not quite sure what to make of the answers, and now, you know, agent-based modeling, it's a great way of tackling complex systems, dynamics, and things that you can't possibly model using, uh, you know, uh, standard standard models. But yeah, I, I, I do worry that uh, sometimes the, uh, the assumptions in there are perhaps somewhat unrealistic in order to get results, and we it can take us quite far from reality. But having said that, I think that's how our profession proceeds. We just need to start models and to uh, continue to uh, have others, and if we get sort of consistency from a number of studies that start to point towards the same answer, then I think we can start to have more and more confidence uh, in the results. Great. Thank you. Keith, did you have any additional comments on that topic? Yeah, I, I'll follow along with what James said. I think we have had models like that for a long time, of the math programming models that were very popular a few decades ago. Uh, we're kind of the same thing, uh, and I think the key thing for us to, to accept those is that you have to be very transparent about your assumptions. The difficulty is that in building a model like that, you are, uh, it's, it's just a huge task to do what I just said, uh, because all these parameters come from various places. Um, I think James's point is very good, is that we, if we get multiple models and, and they seem to be pointing us in the same direction, we can, be, we can have greater confidence. But we don't have, in many instances, the statistical uh, tests that we w w normally make us comfortable. But I think we will find that in, in certain instances that we're, we're simply going to turn to those models because we don't have any alternative. And that's, and that's probably what we should do. Great, thank you. Um, James, did you have any comments about your conversation during the breakout group? Did you have any things that came up for you that you might want to talk about here? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked me because I scribbled out some things and I was hoping you'd ask me that. Um, we talked a lot about agribusiness and the role of agribusiness in our profession and it's sort of and the relationship to the business school. So increasingly, and I think it's true in the US as well, but in Canada, many of our undergraduate curriculums are turning towards agribusiness. That seems to be the bread and butter. That's where the student numbers are coming in. And so we sort of have this divide. We have the traditional ag econ economy uh, departments that have not tended to do much ag business in their own research, but now curriculums that are full of ag business. And then we have business schools that are teaching business and business school marketing versus agricultural marketing. So the world seems to be, it's sort of a, a, at an interface right now, and it's not sure how this is going to sort out. I think agribusiness is an increasingly important uh, component, but I think it, it, in some sense it's been a little bit shunned in our discipline. And I think as, as ag economists, we would be wise to bring agribusiness back into our fold and include it mainstream as much as possible because I think a lot of the issues that I talked about are, are going to be increasing in, in the agribusiness environment. Thank you. That's great. Um, so we have a question about 
about sort of open data and open access for journals. And you know, this has been a big conversation at the USDA. Uh, actually, they had a solicitation for public comments on this uh, that closed a little while ago. Uh, what are your both of your um, opinions about open access for both both um, open data and also for journal publication? Keith, I would like you to start on this one if that's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was hoping you would, but <laughs> I think, you know, every once in a while we as a profession need to stand and, and go look at what's going on in other disciplines because I think a lot of this conversation, uh, a lot of the efforts to uh, get people to reveal funding sources and things like that really started in other disciplines and have come at us and, 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 and we really didn't quite understand why until we looked at the sciences and NSF and things like that. Uh, there is great value to uh, having this open access. A, a couple of thoughts. One is I, I worry a little, a little bit in this arena, are we going to give enough credit to those who produce the original data? Um, I once worked at USDA and there were a lot of very dedicated, hardworking individuals there who uh, created data sets that other economists uh, picked up, freely used, and, and, and really didn't give much credit for. Um, I, I think we've got to reward people for constructing high quality data. Uh, and, and then the other side of this that I think is a dilemma, and I don't have an answer, but for example, if we talk about the, 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 uh, the, the machine data that may be coming off of farm equipment today, um, there's going to be great sensitivity about making that data available. And so I think this is an important conversation for us to have. I think we're just starting it. And we need to think through all the ramifications. I don't have the answers. James, I'll let, I'll let you pick up. <laughs> well, my sense is, of course, I'm not as much of a data person as yourself, Keith, and, and many other people, my colleagues, but um, my sense is that people get excited about big data sets. So whether it's got, you know, uh, crop use data sets from satellite imagery or whether it's genomic information that's being tested from gene sequencing, there's a lot of excitement, like sort of more is better. But on the other hand, I see a lot of the papers that I look at just because you have lots of data, if it isn't the right kind of data, you really can't answer uh, the questions that we're interested in. And uh, so open data is, I think, a, a good concept, just like we've seen open source in many things now have led to tremendous improvements very rapidly. Open data, I, I believe, is sort of a step in the right direction. But if open data simply means just generating you know, data sets with millions of records from very fine grids, from satellites, or from genomic sequencing, if it doesn't have the right, say, price data to match with it, or the right, you know, data about incentives, or if you still got lots of heterogeneity in the agent base that's, you know, that's associated with the data, I still don't know if we're that much further ahead from having, you know, a million records versus, uh, you know, th you know, 600 records of better quality data. So I think that's going to play itself out, and I think increasingly reviewers or need to be conscious of this, not to be sort of mesmerized by, you know, these young scholars who come in there with these huge impressive data sets and are using these very sophisticated econometric methods and claiming things that are somewhat questionable because the underlying, uh, the underlying data that we really need is still not there. And Karen, I, I would echo what James just said. Is the, the excitement that the profession get, has when we get access to these new data. But, in, but the downside of these sources of data is that they weren't created in a structured fashion. And misspecification problems are going to be rampant. And that's why my slide with the three circles, I think that's where the really creative economists are going to find these sources of data and then find ways to augment them and fill in the gaps with the variables that James is talking about, if at all possible. Yes, yeah, so this process, we would like to identify some of those gaps. 
Um, I know that's probably a lofty goal because um, in many cases they're very nuanced, but uh, that is something that we're interested in hearing from people about. Um, and I think that really closes our session. I mean, it's really super points to, to end on. So, um, so any other questions that you have for the presenters, please um, send them to me or uh, just ask the presenters directly. And I'm sure they'd be happy to give you a response. Thank you all for participating. Thank you, James. Thank you, Keith, for your time today and in preparing, preparing for this event and the workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you. With that, we'll close. Take care.